What's up, YouTube? It's time for a review of the new Darkest Hour record, Godless Prophets and the Migrant Flora, out last Friday, March 10th. Darkest Hour, one of the true unsung heroes of the new wave of American heavy metal, though many like to precisely label them melodic death metal, but either way, and I actually made a video about this like four years ago that is now erased from the internet forever, but either way, criminally, criminally underrated and one of my personal favorite bands growing up especially when it came to a particular trio of albums that they released. Hidden Hands of a Status Nation, Undoing Ruin, and Deliver Us. I'm telling you, if you have missed the boat on any of these records, if you will go back and listen, you are in for a treat. On these albums, to me, the band were just so far ahead of most of their peers in terms of writing super catchy riffs and making music that had melody but didn't sacrifice an ounce of the heaviness. And as a vocalist, John Henry was just one of my personal favorites because I just love his particular brand of visceral screams and how he could sometimes switch into this gruffer, grittier version of clean singing, which stood out as opposed to what a lot of Darkest Hour's peers did, which is more of like an accessible rock sound with their clean singing. And I also loved how John Henry was just intelligible. I could always hear what he was saying. I could connect with what he was saying. I don't know why Darkest Hour never got their due. Maybe it's just because like they were less melodic than Trivium and All That Remains, but they weren't as extreme as like a Black Dahlia murder. So they weren't really a gateway band on either side. So maybe they kind of got lost in the shuffle a bit, but that does not diminish how fucking awesome their catalog is because it goes toe to toe with any of those bands. Anyway, so after Deliver Us, they put out The Eternal Return in 2009 and then The Human Romance in 2011. Both albums, which I definitely dug, but it, things did start to get a little stale for me, although, <laughs> I would have been more than happy with a little stale if I had known what the alternative was going to be because in 2014 they signed to Sumerian Records and put out their self-titled record which was I guess we'll say a stylistic departure that angered a lot of longtime fans. Basically it was Darkest Hour trying to pull off that sort of faceless radio friendly melodic metalcore band. There were a lot of big open choruses with super clean singing and, and some simplified chord progressions. But I didn't really mind it, man, because I love John Henry's voice, and I love melody. Uh, the only time the album did bum me out was on songs like Futurist, where it did sound like the band were like trying to get on a warp tour or something. But if you take me out of the equation, people were generally not very happy about this change. And <laughs> we'll give Sumerian Records the benefit of the doubt and assume that it wasn't label-driven. <laughs> but either way, fast forward to three years later... They're back to DIY, they crowdfunded this new record, and they clearly listened to the criticism because this is probably one of the most aggressive records in their entire catalog. The opener, Knife in the Safe Room, is under three minutes of a hardcore-influenced rage fest with just zero time for the listener to even catch their breath. And then later on, a track like In the Name of Us All is similarly unrelenting. And you have the song Flesh and the Flowers of Death, which brings in a straight-up death metal influence to the track. Other than these tracks, though, the, the rest of the songs on here are more or less in line with where the band were at on The Human Romance, but it's noticeably more aggressive, and there's just less room for melody because of some of the dark themes that the band are getting across here. Lyrics about how we're all going to burn, and we're all being used, and things that, out of context, might sound kind of trite, but the lyrics are actually somewhat cryptic, so they're not really begging for my analysis. But yeah, aside from moments where the band kind of bring the energy down for an interlude or a tempo change, this is a pummeling record. My favorite songs, though, are the most dynamic ones, the ones that really use those ups and downs to pull your emotions in every which way. Tracks like None of This Is The Truth, which in the bridge section has these weeping minor key clean guitars that are actually playing a version of the chorus motif. So when the band makes its explosive re-entrance, that melody line that you're already familiar with has that much more power behind it because it's been brought down and put in sort of a different context. It's really vintage Undoing Ruin era Darkest Hour. Another favorite of mine is The Last of the Monuments, which has actually the only notable use of clean singing on the whole album, which again, I wish there was more of because I just love John Henry's voice. But what's cool about the clean singing on this track is it's not like right up front. It sort of uses like textural wallpaper. It almost sounds like when this vocal melody was laid down, it was meant to be like clean background singing, but then the band just decided not to scream over it and just kind of let it breathe and let it sit sort of lurking in the background. And I think it resulted in one of the best songs in Darkest Hours catalog. There's of course the gorgeous guitar interlude Widowed, which is not at all surprising if you've listened to the interludes on Undoing Ruin, similar MO, Similar great result. 
And just on a smaller scale, in terms of songs that are dynamic or at least incorporate some new elements to sort of shake things up a bit, you have another headless ruler of the use, which in the middle uses these full sort of black metal style chords for I guess what I'll call a, a black and thrash section. And also the Flesh and the Flowers of Death, which I mentioned earlier flaunts a, an early 90s death metal influence with just an awesome change up. And then later in the song actually introduces this chunky mid paced thrash riff. And lastly, I'll mention Enter Oblivion, which has this really cool sort of ex sort of atmospheric extended intro. And then for the rest of the song, it just does a great job, probably better than any on the album, of creating more of like a stop-start pace instead of just being full throttle the whole time. And the reason I've singled out these more mood-swinging, multifaceted tracks as my favorites is because this record is really at its best when it's dynamic. Because elsewhere, it can sort of beat the listener into submission. Not in terms of being crazy heavy or anything, but just in terms of cycling through riff after riff of the same mood, the same feel, the same tempo, and it can just lose its edge after a while and sort of numb you. Those Who Survived is one such song for me, as is Timeless Numbers, which especially has a, a sort of flatline quality to it, in the sense that you could skip to anywhere in the song and it's gonna sound pretty similar. And I'll also mention Knife in the Safe Room, the opening track, just because I personally, I'd rather hear a band like Nails take that high speed hardcore based sound to its extreme. I'd rather hear that than hear Darkest Hour do it halfway. But interestingly enough, the biggest cause of this occasional feeling of sameness actually just lies in the riffing style itself. Any guitar player watching this who has ever played metal will probably be familiar with the single note pedal tone riff. So for some context, I'm basically just talking about any riff that sounds like this. So it's basically these single notes with the pedal tone being this muted string. And what Darkest Hour do a lot is they, like you imply a chord progression. So you saw how I changed the root note. That's like a lot of the riffs on this album. This riffing style has always been a Darkest Hour signature, but just all these songs with similar pedal tone riffs and a similar dicka 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 groove behind them, they start to blend together. Look, it's a riff style that I enjoy the fuck out of. It's a riff style that I literally came of age as a guitar player with. But across a whole album, it starts to get a little tired. Last of the Monuments, None of This is the Truth, Flesh and the Flowers of Death, Another Headless Rule of the Use, Beneath It Sleeps, all these songs feature that same style riff with that same style groove. And by the time the main riff in Beneath It Sleeps, which is the closing song, is introduced, you're just like, man, I, I get it. <laughs> I get it. And I mean, to be honest, I had this same minor complaint about the human romance, too. The songs are all good. But when they're difficult to distinguish from one another, the album as a whole just loses some of its magic. But I will say, the quality of these similar sounding riffs is very high on here. I gotta say, I think two, two of my favorites in this pedal tone riff category are the intro to Another Headless Rule of the Used and the verses to Last of the Monuments, both just sick riffs. So this is a great record. I like it a lot. I was sort of hoping for like a Darkest Hour 3.0, in the sense that, you know, the, the Metalcore experiment came and went. And I was curious on their return to see if maybe they were gonna take their sound in like another different direction. But instead of that, instead of Darkest Hour 3.0, what we have instead is more of a return to the status quo. Which, if the status quo is the albums that the band made from 2001 to 2011, I'm in. <laughs> And putting all my biases out in the open here, I think that's a large part of why I like this record so much. These songs are like time machines. They not only transport me back to the, the shiny moments of Darkest Hour's mid-2000s catalog, but they also just in general remind me of that flourishing 21st century American metal scene that initially pulled me into what's become my life's passion. I think longtime Darkest Hour fans should be unanimously happy with this record. It's a fitting successor to Deliver Us and The Human Romance and stays within the parameters of what Darkest Hour fans want to hear. Like I said, I would have preferred a bit more variety in the riffing. I would have preferred a broader palette of moods than what ultimately ended up feeling like a one-dimensionally angry record at times. Because again, my favorite moments on here are when the band really dig deep 
and draw from those different ends of the emotional spectrum. Godless Prophets and the Migrant Flora gets a 7 out of 10 from me. As always, thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe, leave a comment, or shoot me a message so we can continue to talk music, and I'll see you guys soon.